Hello, and thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Into the Killing. Before we get into the episode, we want to tell you about a new YouTube channel we launched a few weeks ago called Paranormally Listed. On the channel, we examine strange and unexplained phenomenon. This includes strange and unexplained deaths, hauntings and ghosts, UFOs and aliens, and strange creatures here on Earth. In our first episode, we talk about three cases of violent poltergeist, and in our latest episode, we look at three cases of spontaneous human combustion. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next episode, which is about haunted houses that were made famous by movies. You can find it at youtube.com slash paranormally listed. But now, for the first case in today's episode, we're heading to September 1968. That month, a popular Canadian rock band, Rush, was formed. Hawaii Five-O debuted on CBS. It eventually ran for 12 seasons, making it the longest-running crime show on television until Law & Order overtook that role in 2003. Also debuting that month on CBS was the news program, 60 Minutes, which is still on the air today. At the end of September 1968, the number one movie was Rachel Rachel, directed by legendary actor Paul Newman, and it starred his wife, Joanne Woodward. The number one song on the Billboard charts is one of the most famous songs of all time, and one you might start singing in your head as soon as you hear the title. It was Hey Jude by the Beatles. In September 1968, 22-year-old Wendy Jo Hallison was living with her parents in Mid-City, which is a neighborhood in central Los Angeles. She grew up there with her older sister, Linda. Their father was a real estate agent, and their mother was a bookkeeper, but after she had children, she became a homemaker. Wendy and Linda grew up playing piano and painting. In 1968, Wendy was an art student at San Fernando Valley State College. She had a poodle named Pierre, whom she adored. She was dating a 23-year-old man named Stuart Siegel. Siegel was a private investigator. He worked for the same agency as Wendy's brother-in-law, Gilbert Court. Gilbert, who was married to Wendy's sister, Linda, was also a private investigator. On Sunday, September 29, 1968, Wendy read in the newspaper that a local drugstore had a hairdryer on sale. She decided she wanted to buy one. Wendy called her sister, Linda, and asked her if she wanted to come to the store with her. Linda turned her down. Linda had two young sons, and she wanted to spend the Sunday with her family. That afternoon, Wendy got into her car, a 1964 yellow-green Thunderbird. She made it to the drugstore, and she purchased the hairdryer. She then got gas at a gas station down the road from the drugstore. Wendy was supposed to return home afterward, but she didn't. That night, her mother tried to report her missing but the police told her it was too early to file a missing persons report. Perhaps Wendy wanted to take a short road trip and get away. It wasn't unusual for a person in their early 20s to go somewhere for several hours without telling anyone. But Wendy's family knew that something was wrong. They didn't think she would disappear on her own accord, even for a few hours. So her family started searching for her. Her brother-in-law, Gilbert Court, got involved, and he arranged for a helicopter to search the area. The next morning, Wendy's boyfriend, Stuart Siegel, got into the helicopter. He and the pilot began searching the neighborhood. About 15 minutes into the search, Siegel spotted the car. It was a few blocks from the gas station. The pilot tried to radio the police, but he couldn't. So they flew back to the helipad and Siegel called Gilbert. Gilbert rushed to the area and located the car. On the floor of the back seat, he found the keys to the car. He opened the trunk, and inside of it was the dead body of 22-year-old Wendy Hallison. The police were alerted. The police came to the car and noticed that Wendy was still wearing her jewelry and her watch. The only thing that was missing was her newly purchased hairdryer. 
an autopsy was performed. The medical examiner thought she had been dead for about 11 hours. Wendy had been raped and strangled with a length of rope. The rope was found in the car. The police initially theorized that the killer knew Wendy and might have known that she was out shopping alone. Also, they thought that strangling her seemed personal. Eventually, the police developed four suspects, a friend of Wendy's, her ex-boyfriend, her current boyfriend, Stuart Siegel, and her brother-in-law, Gilbert Court. The most promising of them was Siegel. The helicopter pilot had no idea how Siegel identified the car from where they were flying. He thought it was as if Siegel knew where it was before they took off. Siegel also sat down for a polygraph examination. He did not pass. But the police couldn't find any evidence to connect him to the murder. Unfortunately, after a few months, the case went cold. We're just going to take a quick break from this episode to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, Talkspace. One thing I've noticed with a lot of my friends right now is the uncertainty of what their work life is going to be like in the future. They spent so much time adjusting to working from home, and now they are stressed out about what it might be like to go back to their workplaces. They are also worried, like myself, that we might go into another lockdown right before the holiday season. If we're not on lockdown, many of us will have to deal with traveling and family members during the holiday season, and that can all be really stressful. The good news is, is that Talkspace is here to help. I've talked to a therapist before, and I like being able to put my thoughts and problems into words. Just being able to talk gave me some perspective on my life, and my therapist gave me exercises to help me deal with the stress. Whatever problems you may be having, you should check out Talkspace. It's easy to connect with a licensed therapist or schedule a session. The process is secure, and Talkspace is incredibly professional. Their therapist will help you set goals to deal with difficult times. Talkspace offers individual therapy, couples therapy, and medication prescription services. When I think about my life, one of the better things I did for myself was talk to a therapist. If you need a little support to help you through the end of the year, or you want to start building towards a better upcoming year, Talkspace is here to help. Match with a licensed therapist when you go to Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month with the promo code listed. That's $100 off when you use the code listed at Talkspace.com. The murder had a terrible impact on Wendy's family. Linda was tormented by the fact that she didn't go to the drugstore with Wendy. She thought if she did, her sister might not have been murdered. Wendy's parents both went to the grave without learning who killed their daughter. In 1998, 30 years after the murder, the case was reopened and the evidence was examined. Semen was found on Wendy's capris and her underwear. Using the semen, they were able to develop a DNA profile. They collected DNA samples from their original four suspects, the friend, the ex-boyfriend, her current boyfriend, and her brother-in-law. The DNA matched none of the men. Due to the limitations of DNA technology at the time, the profile they developed could not be entered into state and national databases. So while the investigators were hopeful that DNA could lead to the suspect, they soon found the case cold again. In 2001, the Los Angeles Police Department created a cold case unit. Fifteen years later, three investigators were working on Wendy Hallison's case. They decided to have the DNA tested again with better technology. It had been 19 years since it was first tested. They entered the DNA into a database, and they got a match. The DNA belonged to a man named Edwin Dean Richardson, who had a long criminal record. In March 1960, Richardson was arrested after he kidnapped a 24-year-old woman in San Diego, California. Richardson had hidden in the backseat of her car, and then when she got in, he grabbed her and tied her up. He later released her unharmed. The woman reported the incident to the police and gave a description of her kidnapper. Richardson was arrested two hours later by an officer who saw him and thought he matched the description of the kidnapper. Richardson was sentenced to 1 to 25 years in prison. 
He ended up serving about eight years in prison. He was paroled in April 1968, five months before Wendy was murdered. Nine years later, on November 27, 1977, 21-year-old Joanna Bogner, who lived in Belmont County, Ohio, went missing. She told her parents that she was going out for a drive and she would be back in 10 minutes. But tragically, she never returned. Her body was found a few months later, on New Year's Eve, less than 50 miles away, near Wheeling, West Virginia. She had been strangled to death. Less than a month after Bogner went missing, two teenagers were kidnapped in Marshall County, West Virginia. They were later released physically unharmed. It's unclear how the police connected Richardson to the murder and the kidnappings, but investigators looked for him for the next three years. In October 1980, he was found living in Mesa, Arizona, and he was arrested. In 1981, he pleaded guilty to the murder, and he was convicted of kidnapping the two girls. He was sentenced to 15 years to life. In May 2004, Richardson was up for parole, but the authorities in Ohio didn't want him back on the streets. So they got a sample of his DNA and then put it into a national DNA database. Amazingly, his DNA was matched to an unknown suspect in a cold case. On October 29, 1972, 23-year-old mother of one, Marla Jean Hires, was reported missing from a Rosemead, California home. Her car was also missing. The next morning, her body was found not far from her home. It had been dumped down an embankment. She had been raped, beaten, and strangled to death. Her car was found near a construction site near her home. It turned out that at the time of the murder, Richardson was working at the construction site. Shortly after the murder, he moved to Ohio. Richardson was not considered a suspect because he had no connection to Marla and her family. In December 2006, 70-year-old Edwin Dean Richardson pleaded guilty to Marla's murder. Marla's husband, Martin Hires, spoke at the sentencing hearing. He said that the police initially considered him the prime suspect. Then, for over 30 years, Marla's family thought that he had killed her. It was only when the DNA match proved Richardson killed Marla that people believed that he didn't kill his wife. Then, in an extraordinary act, Martin forgave Richardson. Richardson was then sentenced to life in prison. Edwin Richardson died in 2013, about four years before his DNA was matched to Wendy's murder. In 2016, 48 years after Wendy Jo Halson was murdered, her case was finally closed. The investigators do not believe that Wendy, Marla Hires, and Joanna Bogner were Richardson's only victims. They think he was a serial killer who kidnapped and murdered women when the opportunity arose. All his victims were young, attractive brunettes. They were all kidnapped when they were on their own and their cars were all found abandoned. The investigators said that serial killers like Richardson don't usually take long breaks, but there are long gaps between the murders that they know he committed. Wendy was killed in 1968, Marla was murdered in 1972, and Joanna was killed in 1977. So they think that he killed other women during that time. They may have even found another victim, 22-year-old Margie Schweit. Margie was an executive secretary at Columbia Studios in Burbank, California. She was a former beauty queen with brown hair. On December 21, 1969, a year after Wendy was killed, Margie was found raped, beaten, and strangled in an alley in Burbank. She had run out to do some last-minute Christmas shopping. She was last seen in the parking lot of the pharmacy where Wendy had purchased the hair dryer. Unfortunately, the DNA evidence from Margie's case has been lost. 
But the investigators believe there are too many similarities to Wendy's murder to ignore, and they think that Richardson killed her. They also think it's possible he killed other women in Ohio and California. But if they have any other potential victims, they have not made that information public. We're just going to take one more short break from this episode to bring you word from our awesome sponsor, America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh. I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but I've always hated meal planning. It was probably my own limitations as a cook because I always felt like I was recycling the same seven meals. Then, when it came to a night where I had something like baked chicken breast and roasted vegetable planned, I dreaded, and then I just ordered takeout. Then the food I bought at the grocery store would be wasted. But I don't have that problem anymore because of HelloFresh. Every week, they have 50 menu and market items to choose from. They have something for everyone, from vegetarian meals to calorie-wise to extra gourmet. This week, I'm really excited. I'm having Mexican shrimp tacos, butter chicken breast curry with basmati rice and garlic naan, and buys the meatballs with pear apricot chutney. HelloFresh also saves me money. With free portion ingredients, you don't spend money on excess food, so HelloFresh is 30% cheaper than grocery stores. Plus, it saves me a trip to the grocery store. You should go to HelloFresh for yourself, because they have an amazing deal for our listeners. Just go to HelloFresh.com slash CriminallyListed14 and use the code CriminallyListed14 for up to 14 free meals, including free shipping. Once again, to get 14 free meals from America's number one meal kit, go to HelloFresh.com slash CriminallyListed14 and use the code CriminallyListed14. For the second case we're covering this week, we'll be traveling to August 1983. That month, 22 people in Texas were killed by Hurricane Alicia, which was a Category 3 storm. It caused $3.8 billion in damage, making it the costliest hurricane up to that point in history. Guy and Bluford became the first African American to go to space. The number one song was the haunting Sweet Dreams Are Made of This by new wave duo The Arrhythmics. The number one movie was the comedy Mr. Mom, starring Michael Keaton. In August 1983, 40-year-old Priscilla Stroll was living in Fairfield, California with her 15-year-old son, Kyle Strachner. Fairfield is the midway point between San Francisco and Sacramento. In 1983, it had a population of about 60,000 people. On the night of August 31st, Kyle left their home at 7.30 to hang out with some friends. He was supposed to be back home by 10 p.m. He arrived home at 9.45 and he knocked on the door. But his mother didn't answer. He thought that was odd, so he looked in through a window and he saw his mother lying naked on the floor. He climbed in through an unlocked window and checked on his mother. It was clear that she was dead. Kyle went over to his neighbor's home and called the police. It was determined that 40-year-old Priscilla Stroll had been raped and beaten to death. She had numerous injuries on her face and her head. The weapons were items that the killer found in Priscilla's home. They were kitchen knives, a can opener, and a decorative piece of wood. Investigators said that was a gruesome crime scene and Priscilla put up a fight. The police surmised that Priscilla knew her killer, or at the very least, she felt comfortable letting him into her home. Some rooms in the house had been ransacked and some jewelry was stolen. The police collected several pieces of evidence. This included the killer's fingerprints and a sample of his semen. Less than a month after the murder, the police ran the fingerprints through what is today known as the Automated Fingerprint Identification System Rafis. Sadly, the case quickly became cold. In early 2012, 29 years after the murder, the case was reopened. The investigators saw that they had a semen sample. In April 2012, the sample was sent to a forensic lab and a DNA profile was developed. It was then entered into the combined DNA index system also known as CODIS. But no match was found. At first, the investigators were discouraged. They looked through the evidence and they realized they had the killer's fingerprints. 
When the fingerprints were run through AFIS in 1983, the fingerprints were stored in AFIS. So, in the subsequent years since the murder, if the killer has fingerprints inputted into AFIS, they would not have known. The investigators thought it would be a good idea to run the fingerprints through AFIS again. On January 20th, 2014, the fingerprints were given to a lab specializing in fingerprints. Just over a week later, they learned that a match had been found. They were the fingerprints of 48-year-old Robert Hathaway, who lived in Fairfield. His fingerprints were in the system because in December 1986, three years after the murder, he was arrested for burglary. Hathaway was 17 years old at the time of the murder. In fact, he was acquaintances with Priscilla's son, Kyle. They went to the same school. Hathaway had been to their home several times. Priscilla knew him, so he wasn't a stranger, which is probably why she let him into her home. Now that the police had matched the fingerprints, they wanted a sample of Hathaway's DNA. Since he knew the victim, he might have been able to explain why his fingerprints were found at the crime scene but there's no reason his semen should have been found there. On February 11, 2014, investigators went to the home Hathaway shared with his wife. Hathaway was questioned about Priscilla's murder, and he denied being involved. Investigators had a court order to get a sample of his DNA. So they left with a sample of his DNA. Four days later, 48-year-old Robert Hathaway hanged himself in his home. In a suicide note, he has not confessed to the murder. He wrote, they took the coward's way out. On February 20th, 2014, five days after Hathaway took his own life, the detectives got the results for the DNA testing. It was Robert Hathaway's DNA that was left at the crime scene. The police said that if Hathaway were still alive, he would have been arrested. Instead, after 31 years, the police announced that the murder of 40-year-old Priscilla Stroll was officially solved. Tragically, Priscilla's son, Kyle, did not find out who killed his mother. He died 10 years before the case was closed in April 2004. He was just 35 years old. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Our fact checker, producer, and sound designer was Nell Clouye. As we mentioned, we recently launched a new YouTube channel called Paranormally Listed. Please don't forget to check that out. It can be found at youtube.com slash paranormally listed. You can also visit our true crime channel on YouTube, Criminally Listed. We have over 325 bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash criminally listed. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for listening. Please take care of yourself and stay safe.